had been out floating paper boats that day. You always did that when you went to your granny's. The woodland area adjoining the village that she lived in had two ponds in it, and you would always go to the one nearest to your granny's house, which was just a short walk back to her warm house with all its comforts. One visit, when you were very small, you had asked her about the other lake, why you never went there, and the look of concern passed over her wrinkled face. Her voice lowered, and you knew a story was about to begin. Well, this hadn't bothered you in the least. In fact, this was why you loved going to visit her. During the days, you would get to fly kites, go for walks in the hills, play poo sticks on the old wooden bridge, and once the sun was setting and the fire was roaring, she would sit you down with a mug of cocoa and the stories would begin. They were fanciful tales, sure, but no one could tell them like your granny. Stories of sweaty fairies, flying cows, and the time she met some little folk down at the bottom of her garden. And so on this occasion, when she told you of Jenny Greenteeth, the hag of the forest pond, you listened along but paid little heed. On the day that you were playing with your paper boats, you were much older. You were in junior school at this point and old enough to play by yourself. It was a chilly afternoon in early autumn. The air was crisp, but it was still bright out and you weren't ready to head back in yet. So you started wandering further into the forest. Leaves rustled as finches and squirrels flitted around you, and twigs snapped under your feet as you walked on, enveloped by the green and brown landscape. After strolling for some time in that familiar forest, thinking about everything and nothing, you noticed that you were standing in a clearing that you hadn't been in before, and in front of you was a body of water covered over with algae. Where before the pleasant chatter of birds had accompanied you, there was now pure silence as if the noise of nature had been sucked from this place. Taking in the eerie stillness of the pond, the other pond, a chill went up your spine. You were about to turn on your heel when a splash pierced the quiet air, and you noticed a mouse had fallen into the water. You approached the edge and tried to reach out for it, trying to keep your footing on the damp ground on the bank. Then, out of the murky depth, with barely a ripple, a sinewy green arm shot out and grabbed you around the ankle. Long, dark nails like talons ripped straight through your trouser leg and tore deep scratches into the skin of your calf. You began flailing like a prey animal, trying to grab hold of the bank, but your fingers slipped through the damp dirt, leaving clods of mud in your hands. As you turned back to the assailant to try and kick yourself free, you saw a face rise from the water. Lank black hair spread across the surface of the water, and from beneath those slimy strands you glimpse those bright red eyes bulging from sunken sockets. Sickly green skin pulled tight across a sharp face. The corners of the mouth seem to turn upwards in a vile grimace filled with blackened, broken teeth that lurched towards you. Thrashing wildly, you manage to twist yourself free, feeling those talons ripping from your leg. Pain seared through you, but you moved as fast as your good leg would allow. You reached for some fresh-looking grass as a route out, and made a great leap to it. As you landed heavily, you realised to your horror that it wasn't grass, but thick moss that had built up on the edge of the pool. The creature was cackling, and you could feel its hot, rancid breath on the back of your neck. Luckily, as you had scrabbled to your feet, you grabbed a large stick, and through pure instinct, you spun around and struck the thing directly in its throat. It fell back into the stagnant water with a gurgled shriek. You took off as fast as you could, hobbling on your hurt leg without daring to turn back. The sun was setting now, and the warm green of the wood was tinged all over with icy blue shadows as you moved for what felt like an eternity. At last, you reached your granny's door, the warm light of home spilling through the windows. Tears brimmed in your eyes as she looked down at you, a small figure trying to catch their breath, soaked to the bone, covered in pond scum and bleeding a little through a ripped trouser leg. She shook her head gravely and said, I see you met Jenny. Welcome, one and all, and let me tell you a tale of gods and goblins. This is a podcast exploring the bizarre and beautiful mythology, folklore, and fairy tales of the United Kingdom. 
We will share tales of fearsome giants, valiant heroes, witches and wizards, ghosts and ghouls, and fantastical flora and fauna. In today's episode, we are waving goodbye to fairies and their many forms and taking a look at something witch adjacent. This is episode six, and we are saying hello to hags. Yay! But first, let's say hello to us. <laughs> okay. My name is Heather Morehouse, and I am mostly your narrator. I have been knee deep in hags for like a month at this point, and it's soaking through into my trousers. I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, <laughs> are you confusing hags with leeches? It's all it's all one and the same to me. How the devil are you, Kieran? I'm very well indeed, Heather. Would you like to introduce yourself? Hello, I'm Kieran Hill. I'm not the narrator, but I am here. Before we jump in, we have a couple of bits of housekeeping, I suppose. Is that what people call it? I believe so. A little bit of uh, order of business. So, we have been away for ages. It's been like over a month since our last episode. And that is because of, well, many reasons, yes. Real life... Uh, happened i have started a new job which i'm commuting to which is something that i've not done before i've never commuted i've never worked anywhere that's more than a walking distance from my house and that's quite a thing to adjust to particularly in you know the strange world that we live in parked my creative career that i've been working on for many years indefinitely our capitalist society forces us into the idea that monetizing our hobbies and turning our passions into profit is a correct course of action and is the ultimate dream in life. And I'm here to tell you that your job doesn't have to be your life. You can just work and come home and do whatever the hell you want. And that's fine. I mean, like there is literally no one else on this planet who's more qualified to speak on that than you. Well, maybe there are people well, people who are qualified. But... People who are enjoying their dream jobs. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But, you know, it's not a failure to duck out if it's not going to plan. Okay, that's a completely separate rant. Kieran had a birthday. I did. I turned 21 and it was lovely. I am finally able to drink in America. 21 plus 11. Yes. Uh. I don't think anyone was assuming you were 21. You don't sound, <laughs> you don't sound like a 21 year old man. You don't look a day over 31. I'm a week over 31. Well, in which case it was a compliment. Take it. <laughs> of course, on my birthday as well. Something we do have to discuss. Yeah. The most important folkloric event of the year. <laughs> oh, God. Yeah. The release of Folklore by Taylor Swift. Yeah. Her, would I say her best album to date? Hmm. Is it because you can't really rate perfection against itself? You, you are can't. you trying to say? You yeah. can't. Like, no, mm. no. Her best album to date is 1989, um, without a shadow of a doubt. Okay. But it's really good. I've been having conversations with people on Twitter about it, which is something I don't normally do, so... Hi, it's yeah. been nice talking to you. You're really cool. Um, oh, Kieran's getting excited about having internet friends. I am. I've <laughs> never had them before. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's a it's a brave new world out there. It's good. Good. Um, I don't like Taylor Swift. You you've just not given her a chance. I think I would argue at this point that it is impossible not to have formed an opinion <laughs> on Taylor Swift, given the fact that she has fully saturated the music world. It's a good album, though. I, I will hit back at people claiming it's an indie album. It's No, it's, it's a Taylor Swift album. And if you like that, then your quid's in. Quite a few members of the folklore community were quite outraged that the hashtag folklore, just the word folklore, <laughs> became branded <laughs> as a Taylor Swift marketing exercise. Were, which I must say I was a little bit outraged by. Weren't you saying that if you use the hashtag folklore, it just came up with a picture of her face. Well, it came up with her initials, yeah. yeah. Either way, mm, bit much, <laughs> bit much. So, yes, uh, very divisive in this household. We do have another thing to mention as well, though, that we have updated our sound system. I would maybe not say that in case people don't realise. Oh, I think they'll be able to realise. I really hope they can. <laughs> <laughs> Bloody hope so, yeah. Well, we've been recording on our phones for all the episodes up to now except for the first one when we recorded on a very cheap microphone and oh that was a nightmare so anyway we've got like proper microphones and stuff now and hopefully it will be easier for me to edit it and make it sound good 
do let us know if it does sound better. And if not, hopefully we can figure it out. We've got a thing that's got knobs and dials and whatnot that I'm scared of. And Kieran is I, having to take the lead on because I, I'm paralyzed with fear. I pretend to know what I'm doing. I'm mostly just twiddling the volume knobs. But um, hopefully it sounds better. And hopefully it means that I can edit these a little bit quicker because I have slightly less time at my disposal now that I am uh, working full time in an office and commuting and all the rest of it. So it also means that episodes might not be quite always two weeks apart. They might be a little bit further apart. They might not. It will really kind of just depend on our schedules. I'm sorry for that, but just be sure we are not leaving. We are not departing this mortal coil. We're just going to have to play it by ear a little bit. You can't get rid of this at this point. No, we're here for good. We have ground our heels in and we are excited to tell you about various things. Today, of course, hacks. The fact is we've invested money in this now. Yeah, we've spent money and there's no going back. <laughs> <laughs> okay, let's get into a hag or two. But what? Ah! If... <laughs> you like that? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Even though you just rhymed two and two. Uh, it's a different word, though. Yeah, true. Different spelling. True, yeah. I think any uh, rapper worth his chops would have accepted that. <laughs> but what is a hag, <laughs> I hear you ask? Well, actually, that's, that's not really what I hear you ask. <laughs> You're mostly just sort of grunting. <laughs> Let's start our explanation with a general definition and a quick trip to Dictionary Corner. Dictionary Corner, you say? Let's Let's go there immediately. <laughs> A hag is defined in the dictionary as an ugly, slatternly, or evil-looking old woman. Or Heather Morehouse. <laughs> I was going to say Margaret Thatcher. Oh, that's, yeah, I, I prefer that. Okay. With older definitions referring to a female demon and an evil or frightening spirit, which means that some hags could be classified as fairies and some fairies could be classified as hags. Speak your words to me. What is hag and what is witch? That's a very good question because... <laughs> <laughs> and very naturally said. Because witches and hags do have a certain amount of crossover, but we are quite specifically in this episode talking about hags. Witch or sorceress or enchantress or other synonyms to that effect will generally describe a woman with some connection to magical or evil powers in our mythology, whereas a hag describes an old woman. In folklore, a hag will often be described as an elderly, blind or one-eyed old woman, bent over with a hunchback, watery-eyed and hairy-chinned. She is a grotesque figure of illness and age. Not popular, the hags. Synonyms include beldam, carlin, uh, specifically in Scotland, crone, hellcat, trot, harpy, shrew, virago, battleaxe, gorgon, fishwife, termagant, harridan, and ogress. Oh. All of which are excellent insults. And metal band names. Yes. Yes, 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 yes. In fact, that kind of just sounds like the album listing <laughs> <laughs> for a super sick bit of heavy metal so the origin of the world <laughs> of the world <laughs> <laughs> whoa <laughs> is like this no okay <laughs> we, we, this is taking a sharp left turn <laughs> i'm starting at the very beginning <laughs> <laughs> dan carlin eat your fucking heart out <laughs> okay the origin of the word hag is located to around 1175 to 1225 anno domini very christian of you <laughs> Absolutely. Common era. Uh, and it comes from the Middle English hag. There you go. Simple as that, really. <laughs> <laughs> you paused. I thought there'd be more. <laughs> no. And the Old English hag. <laughs> Akin to hagtess, meaning a witch, and hagerun, meaning a spell. And it also is connected to the German hexer, meaning a witch, or like Haxan, you know, that film? Fantastic film. Mm. Everyone should watch Hagtess. I totally agree. I've not seen it. Yes, you have. We well, it I don't remember. By the 1300s, the word hag was already being used in the pejorative, a term of derision and mistrust towards women who were seen as ugly, undesirable, vicious, or cruel. And it kind of still is. Because, of course, once women aren't sexy, then they must be evil, right? 
I mean, right. Oh. Although, then again, uh, once women in a lot of these stories are too sexy, then they're also probably evil. But uh, we'll we'll get to that later. Essentially, what I'm trying to preface this episode with is welcome to a world of sexism. We call this subchapter of our podcast Morehouse and Misogyny. <laughs> yes, of Morehouses and Misogynouses. <laughs> <laughs> so we have examples of hags ranging from simple boogeyman figures in the form of old women, as in our opening tale, to magic wielders, nightmare bringers, storm riders, and child eaters. And there are even some tales of hags that aren't evil at all. Unfathomable. That's in our second episode. Yes. So this is kind of a two-parter. Hags you like, hags you don't. <laughs> We're starting with the ones you don't. <laughs> <laughs> Although maybe you do, I don't know. Having done some of these stories, I'm, I've become quite fond of some of the hags in these. But let's start simple and a little bit spooky and talk about some of the hags that appear in British folklore as boggarts or boogie women. Hmm. Boogie women. Boogie women. <laughs> boogie hags. Do, do, do. Da, 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 party. I don't know the words. <laughs> or platoon. Get to the hags and get down. <laughs> Spooky hags are always the best in town. That song was written near here. Oh, yeah. By it's by, yeah, by Heatwave. In Hastings. Yes. Britain's <gasps> funkiest band. There is a particular category of water-dwelling hags that one could categorise as a fairy, lying somewhere between a boggart and an evil water spirit, known variously as Peg Powler, the Grindelo, Nelly Longarms, or Jenny Greentee. We talked about her. Yes, we met her in our opening tale. I and, wrote that. <laughs> and we have many first-hand anecdotes and accounts attesting to the appearance of these monsters in the ponds of Britain, lurking in the duckweed or pond scum that appears as solid ground before dragging unlucky mortals down into the murky water to consume them. Ugh. Sometimes that's called Jenny Green Tea's hair. Oh, that's fun, isn't it? One record from 1915 even describes the horrible fate of these unlucky mortals being visible in a fountain of blood which sprouts up through the surface of the water. Jesus. <laughs> yes. Nightmare on Elm Street, Mark. Yeah, someone's getting a bit carried away there. But that's one of the more extreme cases, admittedly. When it comes to location, Jenny is most often spotted in the northwest of England. One Mr. Higson, as recorded in Hartland and Wilkinson's Lancashire Folklore, boasts that few sombre or out-of-the-way places, retired nooks and corners, or sequestered bypaths escape the reputation of being haunted. With aqueous nymphs or nixies, known as Grindelo and Jenny Greenteeth, who lurked at the bottom of pits and with their long sinewy arms dragged in and drowned children who ventured too near. Edwin Waugh, in his sketches of Lancashire life and localities, speaks of some boggarts lurking in the streams and pools like green teeth and Jenny Long Arms, waiting with skinny claws and secret darts for an opportunity to clutch the unwary wanderer upon the bank into the water, while there are others like the White Lady, the Skriking Woman, Baum Rapit, the Grizzlehurst Boggart, and the Clegg Ho Boggart, haunting the lonely nooks of the green country and old houses, where they have made many a generation of simple folk pay a considerable toll of superstitious fear for some traditional deed of darkness done in the dim past. Ooh. He was really enjoying the alliteration yeah. there. Yeah, making it very unpleasant for, for future readers to have to say out loud. <laughs> Yeah, that took about ten, ten goes, that sentence. <laughs> Do you think this was like an early attempt at like, claiming a copyright? <laughs> I'll try and see you turn this into an audio book, you <laughs> bastards. <laughs> Put that on a wax cylinder. Shove it up your arse. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that, kids. Don't put books up your bum. Or wax cylinders. Yes, yeah, true. Unless you want to. We're, we're, we're a sex-positive podcast. No, we're not. Anyway... <laughs> You're going to be really, really upset when you discover what half the uh, meanings of these folklore tales are. <laughs> nah. Peg Powler is a female water spirit that lurks in the warm water wells that form under trees, which were, at a time, referred to as Hell's Kettles. Oh. Much like Jenny Greenteeth, she is horrible to behold, and her green hair spreads across the surface of these pools as she waits for children to stray too close to the water's edge. It's clear that Peg makes herself quite at home in these dwellings, as the foam that gathers on these wells would often be referred to as Peg Powler's suds, 
suggesting that she is doing her laundry in the warm water. Whereas the scum is called Peg Powler's cream, a result of her milking her cow with reckless abandon and letting the milk splash into the pool. Is the cow underwater as well? No, it's on the edge. It's on oh. the edge and it goes in. Okay. Yeah? Oh, like a, like a rubber duck. What? You know, what? What are you talking about? It goes in with her. No. No? But at least these hags stick to a schedule. <laughs> <laughs> Say what you will, they're punctual. <laughs> that's, that's what matters. Peg is most active on Sundays and is possibly a remnant of a much older water deity that would accept human sacrifices, presumably on this Sabbath day. While in the Isle of Man, there is a particular song that is part of a Hollandide custom. Hollandide being the Manx version of Halloween, in which Ginny the Winnie, as they call her <laughs> on the Isle of Man, comes out ready to bake. Her teeth are green and her eyes are red. And there's a great thickness of hair on the top of her head. Huh. That's the poem. And what a song it is too. <laughs> Wonder what it, how it goes. I think you got it. Ginny the Winnie comes out ready to bake. Her teeth are green and her eyes red. <laughs> I'm still trying to do boogie nights. <laughs> Have you ever heard boogie nights? So those were some of the water hags that populate our land. But more terrifying yet is the crone known as Black Anis. Ah! Ah! Mm, yeah, like that. This blue-faced, yellow-fanged, metal-clawed hag prowls around the Dane Hills of Leicester, searching for victims to drag back to her cave, which she clawed from the rocks herself using her talons. Horrifying. That is that's quite something. She is kind of cool. Okay, but she yeah. is a murderer. We don't like her. John Hayrick Jr.'s poem called On a Cave Called Black Annis's Bower, published in 1797, is an early record telling the tale of Annis. And I'm going to try and <coughs> do my best poetry voice and narrate it to you thusly. Are you excited? I'm really excited. Where down the plain the winding pathway falls, from Glenfieldville to Leicester's ancient walls, nature or art... It, <clears throat> That's a long word. Nature or art with imitative power, far in the glen was placed Black Annis's bower. An oak, the pride of all the mossy dell, spread its broad arms above the stony cell, and many a bush with hostile thorns arrayed forbids the secret cavern to invade. Whilst delving vales each way meander round, and violet banks with redolence abound, here, if the uncouth song of former days soil not the page with falsehood's artful lays, Black Annis held her solitary reign. The dread and wonder of the neighbouring plain, the shepherd grieved to view his waning flock, and traced his firstlings to the gloomy rock. No vagrant children culled the florets then, for infant blood oft stained the gory den. Not Sparta's mount for infant tears renowned Echoed more frequently the piteous sound Oft the gaunt maid for frantic mother cursed Whom Britain's wolf with savage nipples nursed Whom Leicester's sons beheld aghast the scene Nor dared to meet the monster of the green Tis said the soul of mortal man recoiled to view Black Annis's eye so fierce and wild, vast talons, foul with human flesh, there grew in place of hands and features livid blue, glared in her visage, while the obscene waste, warm skins of human victims close embraced. But time than man more certain, though more slow, at length gainst Annis drew his sable bow. The great decree, the pious shepherds blessed, and general joy the general fear confessed. Not without terror they the cave survey, where hung the monstrous trophies of her sway. Tis said that in the rock large rooms were found, scooped with her claws beneath the flinty ground. In these the swains her hated body threw, but left the entrance still to future view, that children's children might the tale rehearse, and bards record it in their tuneful verse. 
Very nice. Did Very I do? Very scary. I thought it was quite scary. It's quite graphic. It is quite graphic, isn't it? This is the, the thing, only you know. Thing more gory than that poem was the poet syntax. <gasps> oh! Bow, bow, bow. Incredible work. I enjoyed that poem immensely. I'm sad that A you skipped reader. out the last two verses. Yeah, the last two verses are nonsense. <laughs> To be honest. So just about how good a poet he is. Yeah, he does the whole I'm speaking to the bard and talking to the muses business for like two verses, which isn't really useful. But we've included the bit where it describes Annis with her fearful visage of blue and her metal hands and the rooms that she clawed out of the rock. And also, ooh, the fact that she rips the skins off of the sheep and children that she steals mm-hmm. and hangs them up in her cave. She's a designer. We all have to have a pastime. She's just expressing herself. She is. We support her. I mean, let's be honest. Skinning children and lambs, hanging up their hides and wearing them wrapped around her crooked little frame like a disturbing dress, eating their flesh and scattering their bones around the Leicestershire landscape is a little bit serial killery. I'm starting to suspect Black Amis. Not nice. So the locals did what they determined to be the correct course of action to prevent her horrific acts. And the method is, it's perfectly obvious. So, on Easter Monday, they'd get a cat, right? I'm not going to like this, am I? You're not going to like this. They got the cat. Do we have to include this? They killed the cat. Uh Uh-oh. They soaked it in aniseed. I guess because she's black anise. The names sound similar. Uh Uh-huh. And what they did, they, they, they tied it to a string and they dragged it across the opening to Black Anise's bower. And the hope was that she'd smell the aniseed soaked cat, crawl out of her little hag hole, and be burned by the purifying light of the sun before being set upon by the villagers' hunting dogs. Ah, uh, that's all. Like, no. It's not a real story! Actually, I think they did actually do the whole cat killing business. There's, yeah, you don't have to go far back in like European history to find an ungodly amount of cat killing for some reason. See, I'm going to throw it out there that if maybe the cat isn't dead, you know, maybe if the cat <laughs> was stunned, if yeah, if there was a, just a lightly bemused cat that came in smelling of sambuca, I'd come out and say hi. <laughs> I'd want it to be my friend. You see, one of our cats came through the door covered in Sambuca, and you're first one there. Hey, this is nice. You know, I'm not saying one of my cats. I'm saying if a surprise cat came in covered in licorice all sorts, <laughs> I'd be happy. I'd like that. And you know what? If I then died by being burnt by the purifying light of the sun and set upon by hounds... Oh, so you know, in this story, you're Black Anis. I'm just saying I sympathise. I'm saying, and if that's the way I go, then so be it. I've had my fun. <laughs> Have you? <laughs> okay, so if this is all sounding a little bit like nightmare fuel, then you are In right. the right place. Yes. You might be even more right than you realise. Because hags and nightmares are very closely linked indeed. These days, the term nightmare has come to mean an unpleasant dream. It might be the one about all your teeth falling out. Or trying to punch someone who's shouting at you, but your punches do nothing. Or one of those body horror masterpieces about getting pregnant and having a child. Those are all examples of my nightmares. I'm sure you fit, fill in the blanks. I'm just, I'm just saying some hypothetical nightmares. It might even be all three all in one go. Oh, Jesus, that would stick around. But that's uh, not exactly what we're talking about I once, here. I once had a nightmare where we were still living at university. And I came downstairs, and you were a lobster. You were you were cooking some food, and you were like, "Hi, Karen," waving your lobster claw at me. And I was like, "Hey, Heather, how's it going?" And then I looked in the um, frying pan, and it was just more lobsters. Oh my god, I'm a cannibal! Yeah, it was re- really creepy. I, oh, I, you didn't I, like it? It wasn't no, humorous. I, I was I was um, consumed with an overwhelming sense of dread. <laughs> Amazing, and well, that's fun. Yeah. Literally all my nightmares are about having a child. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my my sort of hormonal body or something is just telling me, you should really be doing this. And then every other part of my <laughs> psyche is just like, no! It's causing clearly some sort of internal problem. I don't know what mine was about. 
I did have a dream once where me and Chaplin were working at... Mc- Chaplin is our cat, just to clarify. We were working at McDonald's together, and everyone started telling Chaplin that he wasn't very good at frying the chips. <laughs> And you lost your mind. Uh, it made me very sad. I oh, no. he kept eating the chips. Like, <laughs> the image I have in my mind is just Chaplin in a little kind of like little server's hat with just the chip hanging out of his mouth. Oh. We're very different people, you and I. Yeah, uh, I feel like my nightmares make sense. <laughs> so these are all great examples of nightmares. You know what they say? There is nothing more interesting than, than hearing, hearing things- about other people's dreams. I mean, honestly, I find them quite entertaining. When I was a child... I used to have a recurring nightmare that I was at sort of a stream and it started raining, but it was raining coins and I found it terrifying and I don't, I don't know what's happening there. That sounds like heaven. Dream expert, analyse that. (laughs) (laughs) Send us an email, godgodpod at gmail.com. That's godgodpod at gmail.com. So those are all some excellent examples of nightmares (laughs) in case you didn't understand what a nightmare was. But the nightmare in this context, derives from the Anglo-Saxon word Mara, which was a generally female supernatural being that would visit sleepers at night, lie on their chests, suffocate them, and prevent them from moving. And in fact, uh, one might be considering the Henry Fuseli painting, The Nightmare, quite a famous one. Describe it to us, Kieran. No, using words. Oh, there's a lady in, on bed. On bed? <laughs> the lady on bed. There's a lady in bed, and she's been crouched on by this hideous little, like, stooped, stooped man just kind of staring out into the, um, like, out of the frame. Yeah, and she's, she's swooning, and there's yeah. a horse. Yes. And an owl? And he a, did loads of versions of a it. A cat? Maybe. So yeah, if you've not seen that painting, check it out. It's pretty cool. Displays the concept pretty well. And this experience of the nightmare was also known as being hag-ridden. In Owen Davies' essay, Hag Riding in 19th Century West Country England and Modern Newfoundland, in New Perspectives on Witchcraft, Magic and Demonology, great reading, by the way, this whole essay was really interesting, I can totally recommend it, he goes really quite deeply into this study about hag riding in Modern Newfoundland, it's it's really cool. And he writes that in the southwest of England, hag riding and hagging were commonly used to describe a terrifying nocturnal assault by a witch. Hagging sounds a bit like dogging or something, though, but this is not... It's not sexuous. By the way, if you are... These aren't sex hags. If you are a dogger, we like you, don't worry. Be cool. (laughs) But be careful. Yeah, do be careful. Always wear your seatbelt. That's your takeaway. Observe the highway code. (laughs) (laughs) Clunk flick. But we're sticking with the 19th century West Country England part of his essay, obviously. And he mentions that there were at least six court cases being brought to jury between 1852 and 1878 by people claiming to have suffered at the hands of a hag. While modern dictionary entries define hag-ridden broadly as afflicted by nightmare or anxieties, it used to be a much more specific and frightening experience. In the glossary of the Dorset dialect, William Barnes defines hag road or hag written as the nightmare attributed to the supernatural presence of a witch or hag by one who is ridden in sleep. And in Cornwall, the related word hiller described a great hairy thing which lay on them with dead weight that almost stopped them from breathing, which coincidentally is also what happens when Chaplin, our cat, comes and sleeps on our little chests. And never suffocates the life out of us. No. Honestly, I wish. Yeah. If I'm not going to get torn apart by dogs when presented with a cat covered in licorice, I'd like to be suffocated by a cat lying on me. So this hiller or great hairy thing suggests that the hag rider might be a specifically supernatural figure. In Somerset and Devon, horses found exhausted, sweating and with tangled manes in the morning would be called hag rided. Hmm. Hmm. Is that a thing you ever found when you were a horse boy? Well, I, I, I was never a horse boy in Cornwall or Devon, so no. When the hags were riding around? Yeah. How, did you ever found a, a horse all, all jangled up? Well, I mean, sure, but like horses are easily spooked. Like, you could find them just charging around the fields because, you know, a blackbird was in it. Like, seeing a horse scared is a fairly natural thing for a horse. 
But they're they're all sweaty and stuff as well. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. They sweat like my mother. Is it? Is this just a like thing that? Oh, is that a phrase? They sweat like my mother. <laughs> they sweat like my ma. They sweat... <laughs> yeah, no, no, absolutely. They sweat like the dickens. <laughs> so these horses would be called hag rided. However, in this region, the hag was considered to be a kind of malicious fairy. Like a sort of wizened jockey. <laughs> yes, exactly. And this fairy was supposed to possess supernatural power over horses and other animals, meaning they were also called pixie-rided, rather like the travellers drawn off course being pixie-led. Uh, yeah. Which we spoke about in previous episodes. Would you like a small element of courtroom drama? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I was not anticipating this. Yes. Absolutely. We're going into a crime procedural. Because in a court case brought in 1852, Grace Webb of Crewkern in Somerset claimed that her aunt, Charity Furza, who, let's just be clear, she did suspect to be a witch, would subject her to hag riding. The niece said that by night, when I am in bed, I am hag ridden by her. She was really making no bones about it. She was like, <laughs> this is what's happening. There is so much space for the metaphor in court. <laughs> yes. Be, be concise. Yeah. What would Judge Judy want you to do? <laughs> uh, vote Republican. Oh, she's nice. Oh, I don't know if she is. But I bet she is. <laughs> and when this was happening, Grace Webb felt a load upon her stomach. Grace didn't believe herself to be dreaming or imagining things, stating that she could see her Aunt Charity as plain as she could see the magistrate before her. It also didn't help that Charity was 66 years old and described as... <laughs> sorry, this is awful. Was described in the writing up of the case as not a very favourable specimen of the fair sex. <laughs> as Jesus. if that's, like, salient information. <laughs> Christ alive. So, you know, in fairness, she looked like a hag. <laughs> Therefore, must be guilty. <laughs> guilty by the by reason of not being hot enough. A Mr. Clapp of the same county had an experience reported in the Western Flying Post that not only would he and his wife be laid on by a hag, but that if he tried to leave his bed, he would find himself fixed by the hag in the corner of the room. During the 19th century, accounts of hag riding were generally looked upon by educated folk with amusement or derision. By that point, it was still quite a sort of rural mm -hmm. idea. And they assumed that either these were just the superstitions of the lower classes or a sign of a disturbed mind. But there is, of course, another explanation. Throughout these accounts of nightmares and hag riding, we can see some recurring symptoms. A sense of fear or dread, seeing a dark figure in the room, a weight upon the chest, an inability to move, and a feeling of being awake. Hags are your sleep paralysis demons! And onto these types of nightmare creatures, often familiar faces that the dreamer distrusted would be projected. For example, the case of Grace Webb and Charity Furza was brought to court by the hag herself. Grace Webb was in fact the defendant. She was being prosecuted for assaulting the old woman. <laughs> Because <laughs> the suspicious young lady had scratched the shit out of her arm. and uh, While she was riding her? No, just like in the day. <laughs> to, as recompense for being hag ridden. Although, uh, it was noted that the drawing of blood was said to have stopped the curse. Hmm. So there you go. Which is a solution of hag riding that was generally believed to exist. So we can see that throughout all of these tales, we can pretty much pin the tail on the sleep paralysis. And I wanted partly to talk about this element of hag law because we have a bad sleeper with us. We do. We've brought in a special guest. It's Kieran. <laughs> you sometimes have sleep paralysis, right? I, I do suffer from sleep paralysis. I've never had it because I am neither superstitious nor do I have an unsound mind. <laughs> Pardon? <laughs> Yeah, no, um, it's often times when I'm feeling, like, stressed out, or if I've had a couple of bad nights sleep on the trot. Or if your aunt, who you suspect to be a witch, has been lurking in your room. Yes. So do you have the full the full gamut of symptoms? Um, no. Uh, I, I don't get the pressure on my chest, Ooh. and I don't have anyone on me. Right. What I do get is occasionally somebody stood in our doorway, Ooh. which is 
quite creepy. Man in a big old black hat. Which mm-hmm. is another common character that shows up in sleep paralysis. Ah. It's the old woman on the chest or the man in the, man in the large hat. So the theory goes that sleep paralysis occurs when part of your brain wakes up, but not your whole body. So you feel awake. Yes. And, and you, you think that you're cognizant fully. And you will, your, your eyes will be open. You yeah. will be able to see around the room. Very parts of you that are conscious and parts of you that are not. Yeah. Like I, I get a similar thing where it's not sleep paralysis. It's a similar kind of visual hallucination I get when, I, when I've woken up occasionally. Where I can see like photorealistic images of like I've seen dogs before, I've seen people we know, I saw Danny DeVito, uh, <laughs> and like I can, mo- I can I can move my head around, I can move, but as soon as I switch the light on, they disappear, and whatever it was that I was looking at will be obvious. So you think that they're like in the room with you, and yeah, or it, is it just that you can kind of see almost like an image of them? I can see a perfect image of them, like a flat image. Yeah, almost like superimposed over whatever oh, it is I'm looking like at. Like your brain is a little projector. Yeah. That's so weird. I also have episodes where I wake up with absolutely no memory of who I am or where I am, which is really, really scary, particularly given that it's invariably, it invariably comes with a crushing sense of disappointment when I, re- when I work out who I am. Oh, I'm sorry. That's okay. I look at audio hallucinations like when I'm going to sleep. Oh yeah, don't you sometimes hear people like saying your name? Yeah, whispering my name right next to my ear. Or sometimes blood-curdling screams from outside. That's probably the cats, to be fair. Yeah. Or just the road we live on. We live on a very quiet road. We do. In which case, there must be ghosts! Goats? Goats. Everywhere. <laughs> According to those of a religious persuasion, the common belief was that the hag ride was an assault from demonic forces, incubi and succubi. An incubus is a male demon that will make demon love with a sleeping woman. <laughs> and in the medieval era in Europe, there was a belief that the offspring of this union would be witches and evil spirits and also deformed or disabled babies. And terrible funk rock. So yes, it was a way of explaining away Unwanted children. birth defects and things. Oh. But also, kind of fun, woo, out comes a goblin. That's, that's fun. <laughs> ah! Okay, brought it back. The word incubus itself ties in very closely to our night hags with the Latin incubus meaning nightmare, and incubare meaning to lie upon or to weigh upon. Oh, really? Yes. Hmm. So it's all coming together, isn't it? It's all coming together like a nice dough. Like a nice Christmas pudding. Oh, yeah. As soon as you said that, I was like, that's exactly what I want to eat. Mm. We've basically been living off of (laughs) Kieran's birthday food for like a week now, and I think we both have gout. It's worth pointing out that my birthday food consists entirely of, ch- of chicken and peas. It's worth pointing out that my birthday food... Heather, what did my birthday food... Get, get... <laughs> what did I get for my birthday? A thousand units of cheese and a thousand units of cake. And we've made... By post. Almost all of them go away. I made him essentially the cake from Matilda <laughs> as well. I made him this vast, unwieldy chocolate cake. It had half a kilo of chocolate in it, but it has slowly murdered us, and now we are naught but flab and memories. I'm sweating just sat here. In some folk beliefs, a hag will take the form of a beautiful woman, and this succubus will then use their womanly wiles to tempt men into having sexual relations with them in the night, rendering the poor chaps exhausted upon waking. Love how in these stories the, the, the women are either evil hags or they're getting <laughs> murdered or whatever and men are like, oh, I'm just, it's so tough. Oh, I hate that. Couldn't possibly do my ploughing today. Oh, don't hate the player, hate the game, Marcy. I hate both. Yeah, fair. Wait, no, not fair. There is a tale from the Isle of Man about mm. one such succubus, enchantress, if you will. What's it called, Heather? Tehi Teggy. Pardon? Tehi Teggy. I don't know if that's exactly how you pronounce it. That tells of a famous enchantress adjourning in this island who had, by her diabolical arts, made herself appear so lovely in the eyes of men that she ensnared the hearts of as many as beheld her. And her name? Lucy Worsley. If Lucy Worsley told me to jump over a bridge, I would. And if she told me to jump off a bridge, I'd do that even faster. (laughs) If Lucy Worsley... If Lucy Worms. If Lucy. 
If loose leaf worms told me to jump over a bridge. <laughs> if loosely wormy tells me to jump, I say how high. Do you or do you go from uh, <laughs> Ah, my brain ghosts, my brain ghosts. <laughs> okay, we're not talking about loosely wormsy. We're talking about Tehi Tegi. And this woman didn't drain these men's energy by assaulting them by night and hag riding them. No, 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 no. But rather took over their hearts and minds with her magic. I'd just like to add as well. The story doesn't specifically state that she was really an old hag. But I'm going to put my own little or in here and say that by my logic if she'd been around long enough to perfect her diabolical arts and become famous in the pre-modern era prior to the internet and much else then she must be getting on a bit right she must have been around for a while plus it does state that she made herself appear lovely hashtag girl boss i'm calling her a hag i'm, I, I'm saying it i i think i think this is not my feminine. What say you to my reasoning? No, no I think that's fair. Um, I think so. And if anyone wants to step to me and tell me that I am compiling a bad list of hags, then I say, you do it then, you bugger. <laughs> Bally who sucks to you. The story recorded in the folklore <laughs> of the Isle of Man by A.W. Moore in 1891 explains... The passion they had for her so took up all their hearts that they entirely neglected their usual occupations. They neither ploughed nor sowed, neither built houses nor repaired them. Their gardens were all overgrown with weeds, and their once fertile fields were covered with stones. Their cattle died for want of pasture, their turf lay in the bowels of the earth undug for, and everything had the appearance of utter desolation. Even propagation ceased, for no man could have the least inclination for any woman but this universal charmer who smiled on them, permitted them to follow and admire her, and gave everyone leave to hope that he himself would at last be the happy he. I like that sentence. I like that sentence, yeah. Using her glamour, she drew all the men in a zombie-like procession through the island, and as she rode a milk-white palfrey, they all walked transfixed behind her. She led them into a deep river, which by her art she made seem passable, and when they had all walked a good way in it, she caused a sudden wind to rise, which drove the waters in such abundance to one place, and swallowed up these six hundred poor lovers in the tumultuous waves after which some people on the shore spotted her transforming herself into a bat and she flew through the air till she was out of sight and her palfrey turned into a sea hog or porpoise and instantly plunged itself to the bottom of the stream that's adorable i think slightly disappointingly the conclusion that was given to us of this sexy pied piper tale is as follows women should always travel by foot Naturally. <laughs> and they should always follow the men. And if anyone on the Isle of Man spots a woman walking in front of a man, everyone should stop what they're doing and start screaming at her. Tehi Tegi, they should go. Because that was the name of the witch. Does this happen to this day? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> but apparently it was happening in 1891, so... That's scarily recent. Yeah. I, I think wonder... they have cars now, so it's all under control. I wonder if she's more of a Queen Mab type than a hag. There's a lot of fairy elements to her as well. Yes, no, totally. I mean, there's there's a lot. There's a lot. And she transforms into a bat. I mean, that's a little bit fairyish. It's even a little bit vampire-ish. Really? There's a lot of milk-white animals that fairies seem to particularly yeah. enjoy or hang around with. That is fantastic. That's good fun. It is true that once we get close up with witches, enchanters, and glamour, or illusion... Michael. <clears throat> In the world of British folklore, we're going to get mixed up with fairies. As we spoke about previously in earlier episodes, prior to the intellectualization of folklore in the 19th century, most believers in these folk tales would not necessarily differentiate between different types of supernatural being. They were all seen to belong to one general category of spirit. A ghost, a fairy, a witch, a hag... They're all broadly the same type of thing, and as such, the stories often converge and diverge. And so, a spooky magical entity in the form of a woman 
Could be a witch, could be a demon, could be a fairy. It's all fair game. Who knows? Who knows? Hence, it feels relegant. Relegant. Relegant or relegant. Uh, at least you've moved on from Boogie Nights. <laughs> and hence, it feels relevant. Ooh, I really can't say that word. Relegant. It feels pertinent, again, ah, to speak ah. a little further on the Welsh Gwicklian. The Storm Hags. Wow. Mm. Which we mentioned in our series on fairies, and particularly in their relationship to nature and the landscape. But they're scary old ladies, too. So they can join in the other hags and the hag party. Gwicklian can join the hags at the hag party. That's my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Rather like their water-dwelling cousins, Jenny Greenteeth and Peg Powler, the Gwicklian occupy remote places and lead wanderers astray. But these hags live in the Welsh mountain paths. They dress all in grey with hoods over their grim faces and ride on the storms. Ooh. Ooh. So when thunder and lightning hits the valleys, the Gwicklian are bound to show up. In the book, the best book, British goblins, Wurt Sykes <laughs> grants us a tale from Robert Williams of Langattuck in Crick Howell, who, he tells us, was a substantial man and of undoubted veracity. Wait, hang on, does that mean he was a, a big man? Yeah. He was a substantial man. And as such, can't lie. He's true. The fatter a man is, the more truthful he is. What's he got to lie about? He a big boy. He's also... Once you get that much weight on you, you literally cannot lie. It becomes a, a discomfort for you. Yes. And he tells this tale of one such hag. <clears throat> As he was travelling one night over part of the Black Mountain, I mean, that's a clue, things aren't going to go well, are they? He saw an old woman. And at the same time, found that he had lost his way. Oh, coincidence. Oh. Really quick, like, say wallet. And he saw her scuttering down the road <laughs> with his wallet. <laughs> the <laughs> end. Hag, hag! <laughs> <laughs> no, 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 you misunderstand. He lost his way. Not knowing her to be a spectre, he hallooed to her to stay for him. That's what it says. Hello, hello. <laughs> but receiving no answer, he thought she was deaf. He then hastened his steps, thinking to overtake her. But the faster he ran, the further he found himself behind her, at which he wondered very much, not knowing the reason of it. He presently found himself stumbling in a marsh, at which discovery his vexation increased. And then he heard the old woman laughing at him with a weird, uncanny, cackling old laugh. <laughs> yeah, cackling and crackling and All I'm hearing from this story so far is woman wants to be left alone. Man will not leave her alone. Ends up getting himself stuck in the marshes and is wondering why she's not helping him. And then she laughs at him. Yeah. Which fair enough. Yeah. This set him to thinking that she might be a gwickle. A gwickle. <laughs> Welsh people, I'm sorry. Anyway, he suspected that she was a, a storm hag. There we go. We'll translate it. And when he drew out his knife to waggle it at her, the old woman vanished. And then he was sure of it. For Welsh ghosts and fairies are afraid of knives. So is everyone. <laughs> that's what I thought. Yeah, I think that's reasonable. <laughs> but no, 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 she disappeared in a sort of supernatural way. Another figure that sits in the middle of a Venn diagram of hag, witch and fairy is the Scottish Queen of the Fairies, often known as Nick Nevin. According to the Dictionary of the Scots Language, this name is first recorded in Montgomery's Flighting, which was written, or at least published, in 1585. The name is Gaelic in origin, from Nick, meaning daughter of, and, and Nevin, meaning little saint. So, daughter of the little saint. I don't really know what little saint is. I think it's possibly suggesting that it's not saintly. Oh, okay. I don't really know. So, rather than kind of like, um, like a small gods, or like household deity sort of situation. Yeah, I think so, because it was euphemistically used as a witch's nickname. And perhaps passed on to succeeding generations of witches. Now, Nick Nevin is often described in fearsome terms. In his Letters on Demonology and Witchcraft, in 1830, Walter Scott, the Scottish playwright, poet, and novelist, spoke in some quite fabulous prose about Nick Nevin. 
He suggests that the Celts drew in parts of Norse mythology, such as the Drows and Duragar, into elements of their fairy belief, and suggests that it was from the same source also, in all probability, that additional legends were obtained of a gigantic and malignant female, the Hecate of this mythology, who rode on the storm, ah, familiar, and marshalled the rambling host of wanderers under her grim banner, this hag, in all respects the reverse of the Mab or Titania of the Celtic creed, was called Nick Nevin. And in that later system, which blended the faith of the Celts and the Goths on this subject, the great Scottish poet Dunbar has made spirited description of this Hecate riding at the head of witches and good neighbours, fairies namely, sorceresses and elves, indifferently upon the ghostly eve of all hallow mass. Oh. So... That's pretty awesome. And in the previously mentioned Flighting by Montgomery, one of these flights is described, in which all sorts of wild fairy spirits gather together, forming a chaotic mass of activity, a little like the unseelie parades that we talked about. Here is a little excerpt when it's describing the different ways that all the different fairies are taking on this flying procession. Uh -huh. It says, uh, Some saddled a she-ape, all grathed into green. Grathed means clothed. Some hobbling on a hemp stalk, sword and to the height, the king of fairy and his court, and the elf queen, with many eldritch incubus, was riding that night. Mm. Ah! So, again, that brings us back to the image of the incubus nightmare and flying around freakishly in the night. Hags just love it. They love flying around. They love getting freaky with it, getting a little weird <laughs> on it, <laughs> sitting on some chests, getting a little bit groovy. <laughs> 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 this was the point in my writing that I was typing furiously. I, I All the little, uh, you know, the little pegs and strings was crossing over. Mm -hmm. It was like Who that. Who is Pepe? It's always sunny. I'm, start, I'm starting to suspect, Heather, that you may find more affinity with the bad hags than the good hags. Just you wait till I talk about the good hags, baby, baby boy. Uh, but yeah, no, totally. These are awesome. I love it. <laughs> 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 I bloody love it. But then I am a big old Halloween loser. Little goth girl. I'm really not. I just, I just think it's neat. Yeah. I've read a lot of uh terry pratchett you know <laughs> i'm just all aboard the witch train fun fact about toot, heather toot. she has a tattoo of baba yaga's house on her leg i do i do yes actually i probably should have mentioned some other famous hags from other mythologies but i do like to keep it quite focused on britain maybe at the end of the next episode we'll do a little roll call of our favorite hags yeah yeah obviously baba yaga is excellent um la Befana from italian Folklore is the Christmas witch. Ooh. And she's kind of fun. In Scottish and Irish myth, Nick Nevin goes by various names, including Satya, Bensosi, Zobiana, Abundia, Herodiana, Herodiana, and Gaia Carlin. A Carlin, as we mentioned at the start, is a Scottish term meaning an old woman or a hag. And the Gaia part of her name may come from Norse words meaning greedy or ogress okay. a lady ogre yeah an ogre lady and it was said that if any flax was left unspun at the end of the year gaia carlin would steal it away for herself so as we can see she is quite greedy she is quite haggly and she's also got some incredibly fun epithets oh, even yeah. cooler than these names how about <clears throat> how about the great hag how about mother witch or how about the scottish witch goddess of Samhain? I like that one. I like that one. Oh, it's so good. So we've now covered the majority of the named and most prevalent kinds of nasty hags in the folklore of the United Kingdom. And mostly they have been cruel, mean-spirited and distinctly unholy, which is great. Way. But sweet Heather, are they good hags? Kind hags? Hags that are pivotal? Hags that are pivotal to the foundational myths of nations? Oh, Hags that form parts of some of our most famous and studied literary classics of yore? There most certainly are, Kieran. By Jove! By Jove himself, who's not invited to this party. This is a hag party for hags. Fuck you, Jove. Get out, Jove. But 
to learn more about those who have to tune in next time. I hope that has whetted your whistles sufficiently. And for now, however, we're going to share one more tale with you. And it's a doozy. It's long. So put on your comfy socks. A lovely, lovely long tale, which incorporates several common hag themes. Spot them as we go through, if you like. The group had arrived that morning from Dublin, and it became quickly apparent that they had been somewhat missold on their country retreat. Far from the grand mansion they were expecting, the village of Loch Glynn didn't even have an inn. It was one of those tiny hamlets that comprised of a single dirt road, a handful of houses, and a church. Undeterred, and figuring that a man of God would find it in his heart to allow them rest, they decided to ask the priest if they could stay in the rectory. The group of loud young men, covered in road dust from their journey, gathered at the front door. Rolling his eyes and wishing that he had taken up law, the priest bid them welcome. And the next day they awoke bright and early, helped themselves to the contents of the priest's modest pantry, and set out into the woods of Driminook to go hunting and fishing. Settling in the undergrowth, they quickly spied a hare and began taking shots. Much to their amazement, despite five hunters all shooting at it, the hare swiftly dodged hither and thither, nimbly avoiding each ball. At last it disappeared, not into a thicket, but a picturesque house nestled near a stream in the heart of the wood. One of the group, the tallest, so probably the alpha, approached, unwilling to let their spoils get away that easily. As they drew near the gate, a great black hound appeared from the long grass, letting loose a tremendous bark and gnashing its rather intimidating set of teeth. Put a bullet in the beggar's eye, laid one of the more excitable lads, and he let off a round. Quick as a flash, the dog leapt into the air and caught the bullet in its maw, chewed it up and spat it out into the grass. The men, now quite rattled, began to level their rifles at the great hound when the cottage door creaked open and out stepped a figure. An elderly woman, gaunt and stooped, shuffled forward. What are you doing to my pup? the hag demanded. As she spoke, they noticed teeth the size of fire pokers protruding from her wizened lips. He wouldn't let us into your house. We were trying to hunt a hare that disappeared inside whined one of the men, attempting to reason with her. Not very successfully, I'd imagine. Well, me little lad here won't bother you no more. Should you wish to come in, she spoke and waggled her wiry eyebrows. <laughs> the men looked at each other. Is, um, is anyone else in there? One of the hunters inquired. Aye, I've got me six sisters who'd love to see such strapping young men as yourselves. Mm. At this, the men became noticeably more relaxed. A couple started brushing their hair back and puffing up their chests. Oh, well, I'd fancy we should like to see them, if it pleases you. At once, six more women stepped forth from the house, each as elderly and dentally horrifying as their sister. The men didn't hesitate. As a unit, they turned on their heels and made for the exit. As they began to see the village in the distance, a sound broke their stride. To their left, high up in the branches of a tree, were seven vultures screeching like demons. They took shots, classic, but again it was to no avail. Realising that these were no ordinary beasts, they ran and made it out of the woods. On their way back, they encountered a man, as grey as a Sunday sky and with a bent back. The man was sat against a wall, watching over a lake, and in his lap he was laying out his sandwich for lunch. The men hurried over and began talking over each other in a great cacophony, trying to explain exactly what they had just witnessed. The man slowly chewed his sandwich, pausing to pull a red apple from his pocket. After a while, he looked up at them and said, Those are the hags of a long tooth that are living in that little house over there. Don't you know that they are under enchantment? They have been living there hundreds of years. They have a dog that never lets anyone into their little house. They have a castle under the lake, and often people see them making seven swans of themselves and going into the lake. And with that, he began shining his apple on his shirt breast, silently signalling that he had said all he would. When the group of men arrived back at the priest's home, they again tried to recant their story, but the priest would have none of it. In the end, he finally agreed to go back with them the next day, on the basis that they were to leave his house and pay back what they had taken from his cupboards. 
The next day, the priest reluctantly dragged himself behind them until they got to that little house. He was shocked by the size of that ghoulish hound that was now barking at them in a manner that seemed decidedly unchristian. There was such an uneasy feeling in the air that the priest felt compelled to pull out his cross, hang it around his neck and began reading prayers. Amidst the commotion, the hags again appeared, and upon hearing the prayers let out a screech so loud that all across Ireland could hear it. They then transformed themselves into vultures and took refuge high in the branches of the tree that grew over their house. The priest approached the house all the while chanting holy scripture, and the dog leapt forth, knocking the priest over with force enough to knock the holy man unconscious. The hunters moved forward and dragged the priest back into their protection, while the dog stood stock still, guarding the door and staring the men down with its piercing eyes. On the days that followed, the priest was too ill to take any further action, so the hunters called upon the parish bishop. By the time that the bishop arrived, the people of the village had heard rumours that these Carlins had been coming out of the house, and rallied together to beg that he banish the evil hags of Draminic Woods. The bishop explained that although it brought him much shame, he was not equipped to face such loathsome creatures. However, he would return in a month, after travelling for supplies. It was a big job. You couldn't rely on a sprinkler of holy water and a few Hail Marys to take down these fiends. In the month that the bishop was absent, the hunters inquired around the area and learned from the villagers that the black dog was so protective because he was in fact the father of the seven sisters. In life, his name had been Dermod O'Maloney, possibly the most Irish name that has ever existed, and his son, Desmond, had killed Dermod after discovering him, his very own father, in bed with his wife on the day of his wedding. Desmond was in such a wild rage that he then killed his own sisters for fear of them breathing a word of what had happened. One night, when the bishop was pretty much ready to head back to that village, he was sleeping in his bed when he awoke with a start. A hag stood beside his bed. He tried to scream, but not a noise could escape his throat. The hag spoke. Let there be no fear on you. I did not come to do you no harm but to give you advice. You promised the people of Lochlin that you would come and banish the hags of the long tooth out of the wood of Draminic. But if you come, you will never go back alive. When finally he regained his voice, the bishop spoke. I cannot let those people down. I will not break my word. We only have a year and a day to be in the wood, said the hag. And you can put off the people until then. He paused to consider this. Hmm. Why are you in the woods as you are? Our brother killed us, said the hag. And when we went before the arch judge, God, there was judgment <laughs> passed on us. <laughs> it took me ages to realise that it was God. Okay? Uh. There was judgment passed on us. And that... <laughs> By God. <laughs> That we must be as we are for two hundred years. We have a castle under the lake and we be in it every night. We are suffering for the crime that our father did. And then the hag explained to the bishop what had happened on that fateful night. Hard is your case, said the bishop. But we must put up with the will of the archjudge. God. And I shall not trouble ye. Ah. <laughs> You will get an account when we are gone from the wood, said the hag, and she disappeared. The next morning, the bishop made for Loch Glynn, and upon his arrival, sent for the villagers. Once assembled, he told the people, It is the will of the arch-king that this power of enchantment be not banished for another year and a day, and ye must keep out of the wood until then. It is a great wonder to me that you never saw the hags of enchantment till the hunters came from Dublin. It's a pity they did not remain at home. Which came as a bit of a surprise, to be honest. Number one to the hunters, who had spent a month helping out around the village and were considering settling there. And indeed to the villagers, who knew the tale perfectly well. That's bishops for you. A week or so after the bishops' meeting, the priest was sitting in his study, nursing his aching head, when a robin flew in through the window and laid a small herb leaf in the priest's hand. The priest studied the herb for a moment, and deducing it not to be poison, 
swallowed the leaf. The moment he swallowed the herb, he felt back to health for the first time since his run-in with the hags. He smiled, looked at the robin and said, A thousand thanks to him who has power stronger than the power of enchantment. God. That's God for you. Then said the robin, yes, this story has talking animals as well. Do you remember the robin of the broken foot you had two years this last winter? That's a robin voice. I remember her indeed, said the priest. But she went from me when the summer came. <gasps> I am the same robin. <laughs> Kill the priest. Oh, and but for the good you did me, I would not be alive now. And you would be deaf and dumb throughout your life if I hadn't brought you that herb. Take my advice now and do not go near the hags of the long tooth anymore. And do not tell any person living that I gave you that herb. Then she flew from him. The priest's housekeeper had been busying herself in the kitchen and had overheard two voices and walked in to find the priest alone, but up and about, right as rain. Not knowing what to do, the housekeeper sent for the bishop. The bishop arrived and demanded to know exactly who had helped the priest. He had a bit of a gouty leg and could do with the name of a good healer. It is a secret, said the priest with a wink. Ding, priest wink. But a certain friend gave me a little herb and it cured me. God. It was God. The year came and went without issue, as the villagers took the words of the bishop to heart and did not disturb that forest. One night, the bishop once again awoke with a start to find a long-toothed hag at the foot of the bed. Although rather than reacting with fear, the bishop motioned for her to say her piece. A week from today, said the hag, there will be seven vultures dead at the door of our house in the wood. Give orders to bury them in the quarry that is between the wood and bally glass. That is all I am asking of you. And with that, the hag took her leave. A week later to the day, the bishop, flanked by the hunters, found himself again in front of the hag's house, again facing that fearsome dog. This time, though, the dog began running circles, wider and wider, until he leapt at a full gallop straight into the lake. And, as expected, there were seven vultures lying at the doorstep. Pick them up and follow me, said the bishop. Once the men arrived at the quarry, the bishop gave the hunters the same instructions that he had been given by the hag. After the birds had been buried, a mist descended, and from the quarry rose seven beautiful white swans that flew straight up into the sky. In the opinion of the bishop, and all who saw them, those seven swans flew straight to heaven. True or not, no resident of Loch Glynn was ever bothered by a long-toothed hag nor a large black dog ever again. What a bloody good story. There's the complete nonsense bit with the priest and the bird. It's got hunters. It's got God. It's got priests and bishops. It's got everything you need. A little bit of hags appearing at night. Oh, it looked like it was going to be a hag ride event wasn't it but it wasn't super fun the hags are fairly benign in this as well that is one aspect of it that i find slightly puzzling is that they're clearly not really doing anything other than being freaky again really really their their main crime is being ugly yes (laughs) i guess they yeah they i mean they do have really massive gnashing teeth which is freakish and a murder dog the the murder dog is only there to stop people getting near them though that's true but it's still still pretty scary also Mm, mm. Dogs, dogs as ghosts, dogs as harbingers of death. Hmm. Why never? That sounds like an upcoming episode idea. It does sound a little bit like an upcoming episode, doesn't it? Yes. Put Stay it out of your mind and then become surprised when we do it after we do Good Hags. No, no, no. Stay tuned and harass Kieran until he's written it, because he's <laughs> taking the lead on that episode. Yeah, we remember, we know how well that went last time. Yeah, but this time I'm going to heavily copy edit it all. <laughs> <laughs> Okie dokie. There you go. What a marvellous story. I loved it. I am absolutely enamoured with learning about hags. I've had a wonderful time and I am very excited for the next one as well. So this was episode six. I don't know why I fumbled so much to gesture that number. You can't see me. Well, Kieran can. And I, I, I was disappointed. And he was very impressed. Of our lovely podcast of gods and goblins. Of all the podcasts in all the world, you chose to listen to this one. And 
and all the way to the end as well. And for that, shame on you. And for that, we are immensely grateful. Seriously, it, yeah. it means the world that anyone's listening at all. I do this very selfishly. I, I derive massive amounts of enjoyment from writing this, from presenting it, from hanging out with my my boy, the hog, the hog boy, Kieran Hill over there. It's a wonderful time for me. And if anyone's listening at all, it's bonus, bonus wizard. So again, we have mentioned it many a time, but make sure to join us in our next episode where we will be talking about good hags, kind hags, foundation, or myth hags. It'll be a good time. So make sure you are subscribed to us on Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or indeed wherever you absorb your podcasts from. And until then, I can very much recommend checking out our show notes, where our bibliography for the episode will be listed. Many of the sources that we use are available in the public domain, so they're easy to access. You can get reading, you can explore the topics in further detail i can very much recommend it and if you want to catch up with us in the meantime then we are on all of the social media at gods and goblins or you can slide into our email inbox with any comments and queries at godgobpod at gmail.com and indeed if you would like to help us get the word out about of gods and goblins then you can always leave us a rating and a review it would be very much appreciated. So all that's left for us now is to say goodbye. So it is a goodbye from me, Heather Morehouse, your local bard. I consider myself a bard. Huh. Goodbye. And it's a goodbye from me, Hagrid and Kieran Hill. Sleep tight. Sleep well. <laughs> <laughs>